Okay, um, this is an interview with Robert McElroy at the Hampton Inn, Comac, New York, February 25th, 2003, 9 a.m. Uh, the interviewers are Wayne Clark and Mike Russert. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? All right, I was born in Manhattan in 1920, March 25th to be exact. And uh, my full name is Robert Francis McElroy. Or McElroy, as I usually pronounce it. Okay. Um, what was your educational background prior to going into military service? I graduated from high school. I was the first m member in my family to ever get that far in school. And fortunately, for what later, what became a fortunate incident, I took all the math I could while I was in high school. As a result of that, I became eligible to go to OCS. Now, when did you enlist into, uh, did you enlist or were you drafted? I was caught up in a peacetime draft. Mm -hmm. I was inducted into the Army on the 12th of November 1941, just a few weeks before the war broke out. I, uh, I, I wasn't, uh, I didn't feel bad about being drafted, frankly. For personal reasons, I was glad to leave home and go in the Army. And uh, I, re I can relive the day the war broke out because naturally it was on a Sunday. And I went to see a movie that day. I can remember the movie, the people who were in it and, and everything else. What was the movie? The movie was Sundown with Bruce Cabot and Gene Tierney. It was about World War One and fought in the African in the African colonies. But the thing that got me was I came out from the thing, went back to the barracks, and there was practically no one in the barracks, which is very unusual on a Sunday. So I could hear a few guys upstairs, and some guy com comes down, and I said, where is everybody? And his reply was, they're all calling home. I said, well, why is everybody calling home? Let their folks know they're safe. I said, what do you mean let them know they're safe? We're here in Virginia. So uh, he says, well, Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. Well, I didn't believe it. I really didn't. So there was nothing to do, so I roamed upstairs to the second floor, and there were a group of guys sitting around a small radio. And it was only then, listening to the news broadcast, that I finally realized these guys were telling the truth. So uh, that was my introduction to World War II, really, on that day. I, my uh, basic training was cut very short. We only had 10 weeks. Now, where did you go for basic training when you enlisted? You said Virginia. I was at Fort Eustis, Virginia, uh -huh. near the aircraft artillery. And uh, in January, oh, by the way, that Monday, December the 8th, we quit training to sit and listen to a radio broadcast of Roosevelt asking for a declaration of war by Congress. I very vividly remember that day. But in January, all of a sudden, our, uh, they did speed up our basic training. And in January, we were told we were going to join an outfit that was at Baltimore, Maryland, an anti-aircraft outfit. It was a regular Army outfit, 70th Coast Artillery Anti-Aircraft Regiment. At that time, uh, anti-aircraft was part of the Coast Artillery and they were organized in regiments. Later on, they were broken down into battalions. We get up there, and what do we find? We find out this outfit had been guarding the uh, Martin aircraft plant in Baltimore, was headed for overseas. And the very next morning, we headed for Fort Dix. We got up to Fort... Oh, one of the things that shocked me was everything was spit and polished at Fort Eustis. And here we meet these soldiers. They were in their dress uniforms. Their uniforms were covered with grease, food stains, and everything else. They had been sleeping on the hangar floors, guarding this plant. And I always look back on it and think how shaken up the country really was at this time to think that they had to send anti-aircraft batteries to Baltimore to protect an aircraft plant against uh, a possible air raid. 
But like I said, the very next morning we were on trains, we headed for Fort Dix. We got to Fort Dix and we were issued, issued personnel equipment like helmets and canteens and cartridge belts and things of that nature. Now, did you have the uh, World War One type helmets? That's there? right. As a matter of fact, I, wore, I got a brand new one, by the way, at Fort Dix. And uh, we wore those, uni those helmets for a full year. And we were only at Fort Dix about two days, and they issued, getting a lot of shots. And one of the strangest things they did was issue us passports, military passports. I guess the Army was still in its, in some sense, in sort of a peacetime mode in the, the way they did things. And uh, the next, an afternoon or two after that, I don't know the date, I'd have to look it up, but uh, we got on trains and went up to the Port of Embarkation, New York, at Fort Hamilton. And it was funny, we got there very late, and it was starting to get dark at the time, and a fog rolled in, and we couldn't see much until you got right up to something. Next thing I know, we're off the train, we're in line, and lo and behold, there's a ship right alongside the pier, which we couldn't see in the dark and the fog. All we could see was the opening in the side of the ship. So we went up the gangplank, and as we went up the gangplank, they'd call off your name, you'd respond with your army serial number, which Stephen Ambrose says he's never failed to find a, a veteran that couldn't repeat his army serial number right away. It's true, you live with it all the time. But uh, as we went up, the supply sergeant hands me a greasy cosmoline brand new M1 rifle, no sling. This was a regular army outfit, but nobody had ever seen one of these rifles before. The only people in peacetime who were issued these uh, rifles were the infantry. But anyway, we get on the ship with the very first troops to get on it. It was the former Swedish liner Kungsholm which had been taken over by the U.S. government. It was all painted gray. It seemed like nature was helping us hide the fact that we were leaving the country and keeping it a secret with the fog and everything there. So we got on board. We uh, were put up in cruise quarters. A number of the people who would normally be in a liner's cruise didn't need these quarters anymore. So we were fortunate to get into cruise quarters. If I remember right, our room had four bunks in it, with all our gear and everything. It, it was crowded. I remember it was piled it all against the bulkhead. We were uh, we were on E deck, which is five decks down. But uh, the next morning, they were still putting bunks in the hold. They were still mounting guns on the ship. They were mounting uh, three-inch anti-aircraft guns on the upper decks, 50 caliber machine guns. The gun pits had already been welded in place, and our outfit was an automatic weapons outfit, E battery of the 70th Coast Artillery. The way it was organized then, the first battalion, A, B, and C, and D batteries were gun batteries. They had three inch guns, a gun that was already obsolete at that time. We uh, were equipped with 50 cal machine guns and 37 millimeter guns, which are also obsolete at that time. So uh, I remember we'd go up on deck and watch the, the workmen uh, mount these guns, and we kept seeing trains pulling in day after day. We were there three or four days. Every day a train would pull in, more troops would come on board. And on a cold, crisp, sunny January morning, January 23rd, we set sail. We sailed down New Harbor, uh, New York Harbor, and we picked up our naval escort just outside New York Harbor. And uh, we sailed down the east coast of the United States, offshore, well offshore. We always, there was always a blimp or something in the area as we went down the coast. I found out later there was the greatest number of sinkings along the east coast during the entire war. So. 
We didn't know where we were going. All we were told was to pack summer clothes where, so they'd be available to us. So a few days later, right around sunset, we could see signal lights flashing from the shore and we turned westward. Apparently we were running around Florida, headed for uh, Panama. Of course the rumors were always flying around. There's nothing like secrecy to create rumors in the army. Where are we headed? We pulled into Colon in Panama and the field officers got off the ship. So we figured, well, maybe this is it. We spent a day or so going through the canal and the canal, it, it was really something to watch and always interesting. It, the uh, thing was, the canal is, is, uh, has two passageways, one going east and the other going west. But when our convoy hit there, we were using both of them to speed us through. I remember going through Calibra Cut and looking at the high cliffs and wondering how they ever dug through that thing. When we went through Gatoon Lake... Excuse me, were you allow, all allowed to be on the deck? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. The only problem was going through the locks. Water was limited on troop ships because of the number of people. There were 5,000 men on the ship I was on. It was a pretty big ship. It was a German-built liner, by the way, for the Swedes. Its sister ship, uh, the Gripsholm, stayed under uh, the Swedish flag. It was used to, to transfer diplomats back and forth during the war and uh, sick and wounded prisoners of war. So uh, when we got to the uh, Pacific side, we picked up the Pacific fleet. It was the first time I became aware of the fact you could readily recognize a ship from the Atlantic or the Pacific fleet. The ships of the Atlantic fleet were painted a very, very dark gray. The ships of the Pacific fleet were almost white. The gray was so light on those ships. And as we set sail from Cristobal, why all of a sudden the destroyers started running around like mad and they were dropping depth charges. We never found out if there really was a submarine there or not. By the way, they did not have uh, the naval gun crews for these ships at that time. It was so soon after the war broke out. So being an anti-aircraft outfit, my battery manned the ship's 50 caliber machine guns and the gun batteries manned the three inch guns on the ship. There was also a seacoast artillery battery on the ship. They manned a, a four inch, what we, the Navy people usually call a stern shape chaser. Well, we had an escort of two, two cruisers, one light cruiser and one heavy cruiser. The heavy cruiser was the Salt Lake City, the light cruiser was the Honolulu, and about seven destroyers. We sailed down the east coast, by the way, with one cruiser and about six or seven destroyers. And a couple, well, I guess about two weeks or so at sea, suddenly on the horizon one day, by the way, they, they had float planes on both these cruisers, and there was always one of them in the air all the time. So there was something to watch once in a while. Uh, we, our uh, duty on the guns was usually six hours at a time. All of a sudden this one day, like I say, we could see blink of lights on the northern horizon. And our ships responded, the naval escorts responded with their blink of lights. And the float planes flew off to the north. They were gone all day long. Came back just before sunset. And the following day, the same thing happened. We didn't see the flickering signal lights, but we, the planes did disappear for the whole day. We hit a bad storm off of Tasmania. And I'm one of those lucky ones who never got seasick. Usually on a troop ship, you had ate two meals a day. There were long lines. You had a schedule when to go to eat, but the lines were sometimes slow, so sometimes you'd sit in the passageways for a half hour to an hour waiting for your turn to get in the mess hall. But on this, when we went through this uh, terrific storm, there was practically nobody eating, except a couple of clowns like myself. 
where they weren't bothered with seasickness, and we were even encouraged to take extra helpings since so few people were eating. The storm lasted about a day, but it was scary because sometime when the ship would nose into those waves, you didn't think it was ever going to come up, and it would shake like a dog trying to shake the, the water off, you know. And you could see the propellers of some of the ships uh, spinning wildly as they come out of the water. But one thing I didn't mention, there were, uh, there was two uh, troop ships that were former Grace Liners, the Santa Helena and the Santa, what was the other one? Santa Rosa. Santa Rosa and Santa Helena. And it was the SS Brazil, which was an, another American ship. It was a cargo ship, and one uh, troop ship, I have no idea what the name of it was, never, never was able to find out. But the day after we went through this terrific storm, we pulled in, it was a nice, bright, sunshiny day in late afternoon. It was summertime. We pulled into Melbourne Harbor. We got into Melbourne and there was another scare there, something about they were afraid of a Japanese air raid. So we got off the ships and marched maybe a mile or two and pitched pup tents in the field, stayed there overnight. In the morning there were Com commuter trains passing the field where we were. And you could see all the people in these trains straining to see what the heck was going on, you know. And uh, I remember once a, a flight of American P-40s come racing over the field where we were. That afternoon we packed up, we ate C rations. At that time the Army didn't have K rations. We packed up and they put us on trains. And they sent uh, only artillerymen, a field artillery and our outfit, up into the mountains. It was about a two-hour train ride. So the field artillerymen went to a town called uh, Baccarat, and the town we went to was, was Bendigo, Australia. And they put us up in homes, two men to a, to a home. And we didn't know where we were going all this time. But those people in that town knew we were coming there three weeks before we knew we were, where we were going. In a local newspaper we ran articles about the type of food we enjoyed and everything. So we lived in these homes and people were very pleasant. Australians really welcomed us. We couldn't do much training. They didn't want to disrupt the people's routines too much. So the, the people prepared our meals. We were there for a week. During this week, what they were doing, they were reloading the ships for a possible combat landing. They were rearrange, rearranging the loads. When we left that town, every person in the town was down at that railroad station to see us off. You'd think we were their own kin, relatives, you know. They were all there to see us off. And they were told to give us a box lunch for the, for the train ride. So we got back down to Melbourne, and this time, we were put aboard the uh, Santa Helena. Again, we were, we were to man the guns on the ship, the 50 calibers. And as soon as the ship was loaded, pulled out into the harbor, dropped anchor to wait for the rest of the convoy. And as I came from my first meal on a ship, I'm walking down the deck, and who do I run into but a friend of mine that I always hung out with in my own hometown. I would, we used to call Happy Mills. He was an engineer. He had been in Fort Devens. While we were in New York, we heard that an engineer, Alpha, from Fort Devens was in the group. So uh, we had a nice get-together there. As soon as we sailed, we sailed that night from Melbourne. As soon as we sailed, aside from us manning the ship's guns, oh, they, they spread out the regiments among all the ships. So if any one ship that went down, they didn't lose a whole regiment. So the infantrymen set up their machine guns in all the lifeboats. They set up their heavy machine guns, their light machine guns, and their BARs, all in the lifeboats, all around the side of the ship. And that was the 6th of, uh, of uh, March when we sailed. By the way, we were at sea almost 40 days going from New York to Australia. We set sail from uh, 
New York on the 23rd of January, we arrived in Australia on the 28th of February. But we set sail, same uh, naval escort, at sea for, like I say, for about six days. On March the 12th, we could see land on the horizon. And one thing I wasn't used to, when you're at sea, when you first see islands or any kind of land, it really looks like clouds in the distance when you're a long ways away. We got there and it was very high island, very mountainous. And with the ship steered toward, all of a sudden they seemed to steer away from her. And what we were seeing was New Caledonia. And there's a barrier reef along New Caledonia. That's why the ship suddenly seemed to steer away from her. And we went around this reef and into, entered the harbor. And the naval escort vessels set themselves up at the entrance of the harbor. We were sent ashore that right away as, in, as uh, an infantry outfit, not as an artillery outfit, because they couldn't get our guns and things out of the holes that fast. But the Japanese had been telling the French to resist our landings. They'd be along to, to help them out. They, uh, they brought out barges towed by little tiny tugs. Some of the ships were able to pull in the piers, but I guess the larger ships like ours couldn't. <coughs> So they towed these barges out, we clambered down over the, the, on the cargo and that's got on these barges. And I have a newspaper photo of, of us there getting off these barges with our World War I helmets and things. So we set up that night and two days later, right, our guns and things came ashore and we set up gun positions all around the harbor at that time. We were only there about two days when our battery, our battery was known as a blue ribbon battery. It was, like I mentioned earlier, it was a regular army outfit. Our first sergeant was a man with over 20 years in the service. You name the place and he'd probably been there. He'd been in China and all over the world. And he was a, he was a tough individual. I got to say one thing for him. He was, he was fair. He treated everybody alike. Some of the sergeants I had no use for. They were mean. I, I used to refer to them as just plain mean old SOBs. Oddly enough, for regular army, but all the officers were reserve officers. I guess the regulars had all been promoted to major and whatever. So uh, we were there only about two days. We headed up north. They were building an airfield for bombers in the northern part of the island. It was about a hundred maybe 150 miles north, but you had to go through mountain passes. And the roads were so narrow, the army had taken control of the road and they controlled the traffic. So traffic could only run one way at a time. There was very little space to pass. So to travel that distance, it, it took us about 12 hours and it rained the whole time. We were soaking wet. We got to this airfield in the middle of no place. There were some engineers there, the paving runways, and oddly enough, they were paving the runways on iron ore. I don't know, there must have been some properties to the iron ore for building runways. And they, would, they dug real deep drainage ditches, maybe four or five feet deep along all the runways. And we had one reinforced company of infantry, or battery, one battery of field artillery, the field artillery, by the way, was equipped with Australian 26-pounders. And uh, we set up positions all around the, the field. The platoons and gun sections were, were scattered. What we used to do is take half the gun crews at a time, pick them up and truck them, truck them into where our battery headquarters was for, for meals. Now we were on three meals a day anyway. It was the first time in my life I ever heard of powdered eggs, powdered milk, things like that. At first, we didn't mind the powdered eggs and spam. You had spam till it came out of your ears. I could un Although the cans were mock pork luncheon meat, I don't know whether it's a true copy of spam or, or, or not. But the soldiers all referred to it as spam. While we were there, all we did was dig and dig and fill sandbags and it, this went on constantly. These regulars kept us going night and day, really. We had no slings for our rifles. 
we were using old belts and cord for rifle slings. And one day, General Patch flies in. Oh, by the way, we were known as Task Force 6814 all this time. The, the whole thing was made up of oddball regiments thing, and things from old uh, Army Square divisions, which had now become triangular. So they all had an extra infantry regiment in them. And they brought these regiments together. One, one I rem remember was from uh, New England, the 182nd Infantry. Could you tell what those two terms mean? <coughs> Which terms are you talking about? Excuse me. A square division as okay. opposed to a triangular? A square division in World War I was about 20,000 men. It had four infantry regiments in it. And these regiments were in two brigades. The triangular division had three infantry regiments in it. And it was smaller. It was roughly about 15,000 men. It had attachments when it needed it. But an Army Infantry Division in World War II had a, a medical attachment, an ordnance attachment. It, it, we, as uh, an anti-aircraft, we were not part of the division. We were, we were an attachment outside the division. It was like they used to attach tank companies to infantry divisions to it during World War II, aside from the armored divisions. So uh, they were much smaller, and one of the reasonings behind it is, generally speaking, everything was triangular in the Army. The company was triangular. The platoon was triangular. The regiment, the battalions, they all had three fighting units in them. That's what they had. And the theory behind this was you would put two of your units online. The third unit was used as a mobile reserve. One of the theories about combat is that the last one to commit his reserves is probably the one that's going to win the battle. But uh, that, that was a basic difference between the square division and triangle division. Later on, the 164th Division joined up with Task Force 6814. And Task Force 6814 became the AmeriCal Division. Its name was chosen by Wolf, by the way, in, in New Caledonia. We didn't have a vote in because we were not an, an integral part of the division. We were an attachment to it. But uh, we were still wearing the World War I helmets. The equipment, like I say, some was obsolete, some was old. Since we had so many 50 caliber machine guns, we had many spare parts. So the rifle company that was with us, this place, by the way, was known as Plains to Gayak. The rifle company that was there to defend the area had 50 caliber machine guns that were totally useless. They'd been through so many dry runs and the bolts slamming back and forth from the headspace being too tight, the cartridges would not go down, fit down through the T-slots. So the infantry officer came to us and asked if we could help them repair their weapons. And I remember the receivers on these guns were literally coming apart. The rivets had gotten loose and we pounded the rivets down, tightened them up. We had spare bolts. We replaced their, their old bolts with our bolts. We got them in firing condition again for them. Meanwhile, you could do nothing with the old bolts, just throw them away. But uh, this was a result partly of the skill of this outfit with 50 caliber machine guns. Because if you took out the old Army field manuals on the manning of a 50 caliber machine guns, all the guys in the photographs were guys from our battery, believe it or not. But uh, we spent several months there before they started bringing in, in uh, bomber squadrons after the field was pretty well set. I remember an old DC cargo plane came in and it never flew again. We went, we climbed inside, we found out it, the whole insides had been ripped out for the military use of this plane. And from then on they used the plane for spare parts. They had a, a the uh, C-47 was basically a DC-3, but the C-47 really had a wider belly in it. 
and, and large doors in the side. But uh, it used to be a, a Navy plant, Navy Catalina. It used to fly overhead every day. We used to stand alerts at sunrise and sunset in case of an attack. And as we'd be standing these alerts manning our guns and we'd see this Catalina go flying by heading north. It would come back again just about sunset. And one day the uh, plane stopped uh, and stayed overnight at the field where we were. And we got to talking to them. This plane had, was equipped with all kinds of dipole antennas on it. We were curious about it. What are, the, what are those rods all doing on your plane? They said it was radar. Well, what the heck is radar? Nobody had, it was a big secret. Nobody at that time knew what radar was. And they were flying up the Guadalcanal every day, which was about roughly, I guess, 1,200 to 1,500 miles north of us. And we asked them, do you ever run into any Jap planes? Yeah, they said, I said, what do you do? We hide in the clouds. <laughs> That's the only thing we could do. The planes had a top speed, I think, of about 165 miles per hour. And the crews liked them and disliked them. They, they disliked them because the darn things could stay in the air for about 12 hours at a time. They had great endurance, but they were keeping an eye on what was going on in Guadalcanal. And one of the things of the war that I heard of at the time was a battalion from the 182nd Infantry Regiment was sent to Guadalcanal months before the Marines ever landed there. They landed on the south shore, though. It was to be a reconnaissance in force. Now, at the time, this was a rumor. But uh, anyway, they had to pull them out. They were so badly hit with uh, malaria up there, the Navy had to pull them out. They brought them back. But it was kept very hush-hush. I don't know how I heard about it. But uh, years later, yeah, almost two years later, I ran into the commander of that unit, and he was startled to find out that I had ever even heard about that. So to this day, you never read or hear anything about it, how the Army had been on the, the island. This was even, even uh, let's see, before the Battle of Midway, they had been up there. When the Battle of the Coral Sea broke out, we were alerted. The Navy had promised us at least 72 hours if there was any likelihood of an invasion of New Caledonia. We were told we'd try to hit them at the beaches and keep them from coming ashore. But if they came ashore, we were told to follow the streams and, and creeks back into the forests of the island that we couldn't hold them off. Because uh, there was only our battery and a company or so of engineers there, and a reinforced rifle company, and we couldn't hold them off. We were at least 12 hours away from any reinforcement. There was another airfield on the island called Tontuda Air Base. It was mainly Navy. It was all Navy planes there. When the carriers came into uh, New Caledonia, Nomea Harbor, their planes used to all fly ashore and, and stay at Tontuda Air Base. They didn't stay on the ships. But we were there several months and we were finally relieved by a New Zealand anti-aircraft unit. And we went back and rejoined our regiment down at New Maya, back in the hills around the harbor. And I was surprised when we got back there. It was now a huge naval base. The uh, harbor was full of carriers, battle wagons, you name it, hospital ships. Ships were constantly coming and going, troop ships were constantly coming and going. And again, like in the Battle of, see, the Battle of Midway was in May. When the Battle of Midway broke out. Again, we were alerted to the fact that we might be hit by the Japanese again. 72 hours warning, and we were on the alert, the alert for the whole time. But uh, meantime, while we were up there, one of the interesting things was, on New Caledonia, there's a lot of deer on the island. And uh, where we were, the deer were a nuisance, actually, to the farmers, the French farmers. Not that there were many of them around us. There were more natives than French farmers around us. But we were eating fresh meat. We were eating venison. 
And the M1 rifle, really, was a great hunting rifle. <laughs> you missed the first shot, you got the second one off so fast that you didn't have a chance. Our regiment down in New May heard about us eating fresh meat. So uh, they radioed a message to us. How about getting some venison for us? We'll send trucks up to pick it up. So we sent out a hunting party. And in about three or four hours, we must have had about 15 deer hanging from the trees, all gutted and everything else, waiting for them. By the way, our first sergeant was from Kentucky. He was a good hunter. And he knew just how to go about gutting deer and things. He really was great at it. He used to hang the deer in a tree and gut the deer, and dig a hole at the pit of the tree, and just drop the guts right in and cover it right up. But uh, the trucks arrived very late in the afternoon. They all came with two drivers. We loaded the air on. They turned right around and headed back because they had a big, long trip back to, to New Maya with, with all the deer meat. But to us, deer meat after a while <laughs> was no treat anymore. <laughs> but it was better than eating spam, I'll say that. And one day, before we left the uh, Plains of Gaiac in this airfield, General Patch flew in, and at the place where we used to eat, like I used to said earlier, we brought in half the gun crews at a time to eat, and we had rifle racks there so we could eat comfortably and put our rifles in the rack. And General Patch comes over and he looks, and no, no slings on the rifles. He sees belts, and rope, and everything else. And he asked about it, and I remember him. General Patch was an easy man to talk to. He was very friendly to soldiers. And one of the fellows said, General Patch came up to him and said, I see you take good care of these soldiers. He says, take care of these, they'll take care of you. But apparently General Patch went to the battery commander and discussed this matter of the slings. And in the army, you protect yourself by, when you need something like slings, you keep sending in requisitions monthly, on a monthly basis, till you get what you're after. And we weren't getting it. Well, the next, very next morning, a plane flew in with our slings. It took a, a man like General Patch to get the supply services off their butt, do something. Anyway, now we're back down in, uh, in Noumea. And one of the strange things was, it seemed like I was always meeting people from home as far away as I was from home. One day, uh, we're, we're filling sandbags down at a beach. And there's a cruiser anchored just offshore there, off that beach. And they were bringing their men ashore to have a beer party. And I asked one of the sailors the name of the ship, and he says, it's the uh, Columbia. I said, I hope there's no two Columbias in the navies. He says, no, no, there's not likely to be. So I asked him if he knew a buddy of mine who I worked with on the railroad. I was a machinist apprentice on the railroad before I went in the Army. And he knew the guy. So I went to my sergeant and I asked the sergeant, how about it, Sarge? Can I go out to the ship? So he, he okayed it. I went out to the ship. Well, we had sun helmets and things like that. And he, Army fatigue clothes before the war were blue. They weren't that green twill that they had later on. Uh, they, they were really sad looking outfits, but I was wearing the pants from the blue pants from the fatigue clothes, an old olive drab shirt. I had on a sun helmet, which we had painted green with camouflage paint, and I'm lugging this rifle. And I, come on deck and the officer of the deck is standing right there with his runner. I tell him why I'm on this ship. So uh, he turns to me and says, what are you, Army, Navy or Marines? There's an undescript mess of clothes I was wearing he couldn't tell. I said, Army, he says, got any ID? And for some reason or other, I don't know why it happened, but I didn't have my dog tags, which was very unusual. Uh, maybe I had them and couldn't find them, I don't know. But I didn't know at the time. The officer of the deck was Robert Montgomery, the movie star. I didn't recognize him. But his runner came back, he says, your buddy's ashore. And with that, he hands me a, 
a whole carton of uh, Milky Ways, which I hadn't seen in months. So off the paper, he says, no, no, keep them. And he's telling me about this other deck, you know, he's a bum and he's this and he's that, you know. Nothing nice about him at all. I'm wondering why he's telling me this. It wasn't until I got to the beach, there's my, uh, as I'm coming back to the beach, there's my buddy on the beach waving his arms and jumping <laughs> up and down, you know, because I was standing in the bow of the, the boat. So he was the one that told me it was out Montgomery, it was off to the deck. He was on his way to join a PT boat squadron, and he was traveling on the Columbia at the time. Well, a few weeks later, I get a note. I don't know how he did it. This, this same guy, his name was Reggie Crotty. He came from Long Island here. We both worked together on the railroad. And I got a, a note, came through the message center somehow, saying his ship was in port, and he was in sick bay. He had a hernia operation. So I got permission to go to town and go to visit his ship. So I'm standing there waiting for a boat to take me out to the ship. And the mail boat, there was a mail boat ran around the harbor going from ship to ship. And they called off the name of the USS Flusser. Well, I had a, another buddy who was on the Flusser. I knew he was on the Flusser. So again, I asked this question. I guess it was stupid, but being an Army man, I didn't know any better. I said, couldn't be two Flussers in the Navy, could it? I went out to his ship, met him. He was a first class petty officer at the time, machinist mate. And his ship was on the 12 hour standby. I told him where I was going. I was going over to Columbia to see the other guy. He said, I'll go with you. He said, I'll just go. I won't say anything. So he took a chance. He went with me. We went over to Columbia. Sure enough, there was Reggie in the sick bay. So the three of us were together. Here we are from three different units meeting. 14,000 miles or so away from home, all at the same time. It was, to me, it was a miracle that both ships would be in port at the same time and me be in there. And it was a few weeks later after that, we had a, a high school, former high school principal from Waycross, Georgia, who was a battery commander. His name was Captain McCullum. Nobody liked him. Disliked him very much. He was a bigoted man. If you came north on the Mason Dixon line, you weren't worth two cents. But the funny part about it was when our group joined the Alpha, there were a group of unfortunate individuals from the Oakey Fin Oak swamps, from uh, West Virginia and uh, Tennessee and Kentucky. And these poor guys couldn't read or write. I was, I was really amazed when I found this out. Unfortunately for them, the war broke out at the wrong time because the army was sending them to school to teach them to read and write. And then they got shipped out of the country. So I used to have to read some of their, their letters to them and write the answers, the replies, and help them go through it. I asked some questions, you know, and you should, you should say this, you should say you're well and so forth, and you miss your family and things like that. But all the non-coms, like I said, were regular army men. Most of them, they were either from Pennsylvania or from the south. The Pennsylvanians joined the army to get away from the coal fields. That's what I found out. But uh, Cap they were taking uh, applications for OCS. Captain McCollum would not consider an application from anybody unless he was a non-com. And we came in, we were the last men to join the outfit. All of the positions from PFC to first sergeant were taken over by the regular army men. No matter who you were or what you were, you couldn't get a promotion from private to PFC in that outfit. So uh, none of us were eligible to apply for OCS. No, but the funny thing, one day I'm suddenly questioned I don't remember who it was that questioned me now. Would you apply for OCS if somebody would accept your application, you know? I said, well, Captain McCollum wouldn't accept an application. And I was told, answer the question, would you apply for OCS? I said, yeah. My main motive, though, was to get back to the States more than anything else. I, frankly, I really wasn't interested in getting a commission. It was the furthest thing from my mind. But I figured, boy, if I go to this, yes, I'd get back home. 
God knows when we're going to go back, back home, you know. And uh, so I filled it out. The next thing I know, I'm told to report to a board of review. Never knowing who accepted this application or why, or why I was even asked to, to fill one out. But uh, I go before the board of review, and uh, the battalion commander, it was all field grade officers, officers of major rank or higher. Our uh, battalion commander was the chairman of the board, although I didn't know him at the time. He was, his name was Romline, and he was from uh, the Bronx, by the way. And they questioned me, they asked me about the war situation in various parts of the world, and what my education was like, and I remember one of the things that embarrassed me, they asked me, do you know the law of signs? Well, I'd been out of high school for three or four years. As the term is awfully familiar to me, but for the life of me, my mind is a blank. And uh, I remember Colonel Romine saying, you took trig, didn't you? Yes, sir, right away. I knew what the law of signs was. And one other question they asked me, what's the situation in North Africa at this time? So I just thought to describe this about how they had pushed the Germans out onto Cape Bon, and the Germans had no place to go except eventually surrender. And all the officers on the board were looking at one another and grinning. And Colonel Romline says to me, when did you last see a news bulletin? I said, about two weeks ago. He says, well, you're right for two weeks ago, but he says, you might like to know that Germans surrendered. So that's when I first found out about the surrender of the Germans in North Africa. We left uh, shortly after that, our former first sergeant, Raleigh Cole, was made a first lieutenant. I found that afterwards he was carrying officers' uniforms in his baggage when we left the States. But they wanted to give him a commission in a service unit, quartermaster or something like that. And Raleigh Cole didn't want that. He wanted it in a combat unit, and preferably in uh, the 70th Coast Artillery. And while we were at Plain de Gaillac, the many of the staff officers would come up and they'd sit down with Raleigh Cole for hours and they'd be chatting away. We never knew what was going on. We thought maybe they're reserve officers, maybe they want to learn something from Raleigh Cole with all his years of service. But apparently, I have a hunch, they were talking to him mainly about his commission. And he finally got his commission. And one night we were told we are going to Guadalcanal, so we're taking all our 50 caliber ammunition, replacing it with new ammunition. We're loading the, the 50 caliber machine gun magazines with new ammunition. And while we were doing this, I lost my wallet. I couldn't find it any place. Meantime, I got worried that I had passed the border reviews and would be going to OCS at some future date. When we got up to Guadalcanal, I figured that's the end of that. I'm on the, in a new command, but what I didn't know was we were still in the same command. They, the Navy had a command called First Island Command. We were really under Navy command. Halsey was a, a real commander. And uh, when we got up to Guadalcanal, we figured, well, that's the end of that. We were at Guadalcanal for only about two days. We unloaded from the ships, Navy uh, ships. Oh, before we left for Guadalcanal, we loaded on these Navy combat transports. And Navy combat transports are a lot more comfortable than the Army transports. There's more room for the men on them. Uh, they weren't as crowded. The food was better for another thing. And uh, we practiced landing. We practiced climbing over the ship sides down the cargo, cargo nets. We practiced getting into the landing craft as they hung on the davits. And this went on night and day while we were waiting for the convoy to form up. Finally, one day we set sail. And Raleigh Cole, all of a sudden, is promoted to captain. Our former Captain McCollum is gone. We were glad to see him gone. Not only that, we were finally equipped with up-to-date guns. Our 37s had been taken away from us, and we were issued 40 millimeter guns to replace them. And strangely enough, they came from the Marines. They were all Mark 14 Marine Defense Battalion. 
and we head up the Guadalcanal. The first night out, no, it wasn't the first night. It was the day before we got there. The convoy is raided by the Japs. Just about sunset, the Jap planes came in. I had been, oh, and Raleigh Cole, I don't know how he did it. He talked the, the ship's commander into letting us man the 50 caliber machine guns. And the only reason I think maybe the, the captain allowed this was the fact that we would man the guns constantly, where the Navy crews only manned them under the, on the condition red. And we had nothing else to do on the ship, so we were on them constantly. And again, it was six hour tricks at each time. I had just been relieved, and I'm walking back towards where my bunk was, and one of the destroyers in the convoy lets off with that whoop, whoop, whoop thing. It was the first time in my life I ever heard that. I didn't know. It was, a, it was an alarm. I, I never knew that about that sound, you know, that it was really an alert alarm. And it fires its five-inch guns at something. It was a ship fresh out from the States, too, oddly enough. It was the first one to spot these planes. And these planes come in, all the guns in the group start to fire. There were... Uh, Four troop ships in this convoy, all Navy troop ships. I don't remember what our escort consisted of at the time. But this, I ducked under a lifeboat. I want to stay on deck and watch the action. And the Navy has these sergeants at arms. That was a big burly guy. He must have been six foot two or more. He grabs me by the seat of the pants and the collar of my shirt, throws me down a hatch and dogs it down behind me. I get down there and I'm laying in my bunk and I can hear the guns going off. Well, I guess it was from so many alerts and things, I don't know why. The men, the other men from my battery were all laying there, nobody's saying anything, it's quiet. Nobody seemed to be upset or nervous. As a matter of fact, I fell asleep. Ship's guns banging away. It was boring as hell being down below, not knowing what was going on up above. I really, I fell sound asleep. I didn't find out from the other members of my battery the next morning. That raid went on for about four hours. The Japs must have been sending in flight after flight, but they didn't hit anything, fortunately. So the next morning we we dropped anchor off a coil canal not far from Henderson Airfield, and we started unloading. Well, loading and unloading ships is back-breaking work. It really is. And the, the Navy crews would man the cranes on the ships and lower things into the landing craft. And it was hot. We got up before dawn, had breakfast, and were rushed to shore. And while the Navy loaded the landing craft, we were on the shore unloading them. Some of the material was easy to unload because it was already loaded on the trucks. But other stuff, you had to take it and pile it up on the beach, and the trucks would keep coming back from wherever our assembly point was. And we'd reload the stuff on the trucks. This went on for hours. And we weren't eating. We ran out of water. It was hot as hell. And finally, the men reached a point where they just couldn't move anymore. We absolutely refused to move. And the uh, Navy, the ship's commander, was raised in hell because he wanted to get out of there. They, uh, they didn't like to hang around because of the constant air raids. So finally our regimental commander came down and pleaded with us. We don't know what was wrong. We told him we hadn't eaten. We were all out of water and everything. So he talked us into going back to work and had food sent down to us and water sent down to us. And we finished unloading the ships. Only about two days later we were loading ships again. Only this time it was LSTs. This time it was a lot easier because... Everything that was going on the LSTs was on trucks. So we loaded on the LSTs, we took our 40 millimeter guns, put them on the upper deck and set them up in firing position. That LST had plenty of guns on it when we got through with it. Because all of our guns are mounted all on the upper deck ready for action, had ammunition stored by them. And we, we tried to get off the beach all day long. The thing just couldn't get off the beach and what I was dreading I hope they don't unload, make us unload this thing to get it off the beach, but they didn't. About midnight, I'm asleep alongside our gun, and I felt the ship move, and apparently the tide came in, the ship broke loose. 
So we set sail before dawn. We're headed for the Russell Islands. As we're sailing towards the Russell Isles, the Japs let loose with one of the biggest air raids they ever sent against uh, Guadalcanal. And all the way there, there were planes in the air flying both ways. Our planes flying west and the Japanese planes flying east. And you could hear the, the air battles going on. Half the time you couldn't see them due to the clouds, but you could hear the machine guns going off. Every once in a while you'd see a plane came, come down out of the clouds. And we got to the Russell Islands. It was easy unloading there because, like I said, everything was on trucks. We had some new officers in the battery. And they were horrified at the way we handled the 40 millimeter ammunition. These things had super sensitive contact fuses. They'd even go off, they hit a raindrop. But uh, they were met really, if they hit any part of the plane at all, to go off. And when they got out about 10,000 yards, they'd automatically explode so they wouldn't come back down on their own troops. So uh, we, un we unloaded, but we were taking this ammunition, taking it from the, from the uh, LST. We got to where we wanted. We just kicked it off the back of the truck. Tum these things were tumbled off. They were loaded in Navy uh, containers. The Army containers were different. The Navy containers were heavy galvanized steel with a locking top on it. It was waterproof. Ours were, ours were, were flat things. We were kicking these things off. These heavy cans were even getting dented. And this, this new officer, first off in the States, he's horrified. He's hollering, stop, stop, stop. And the sergeant's saying, we got to unload this stuff as fast as we can, Lieutenant. The lieutenant goes to the battery commander, who is now Raleigh Cole, and Raleigh Cole says, no, we have to do that, you know. Here we're kicking this stuff off as though it was something harmless. We stayed there two or three days, air raids every night, but we weren't set up to, to uh, fight them. We were, we were headed for New Georgia Islands. We were another new task force. So a couple of days later, we load up on LCTs. Now LCTs maybe can carry maybe only one quarter of what an LST can carry. They're flat bottoms. They can only do about six to 12 knots, something like that. They're very slow. And we set off at dawn one morning. It was raining like hell, windy, getting stormy. We had six LCTs with us. We had a couple of rifle companies in the LCTs. We had our battery in, in two LCTs. We had B battery, which was a three-inch gun battery from our regiment on a couple of LCTs. And we headed off towards New Georgia. It was about 75 miles open sea we had across. Our escort was two wooden mine sweepers. They looked like fishing trawlers. The biggest weapon they had on them were 20 millimeter anti-aircraft guns. We set sail in these heavy seas, raining all the time. We could hardly see one another. We'd get down the trough of the waves, you couldn't see the other vessels in the convoy. And about rain constantly, just about sunset, we get to our destination. And as we pull up, they had beached the LCTs and Half of our battery was to get off. We were at Wickham Anchorage on Van Gogna Island, which was just east of, of New Georgia Island, the main island of New Georgia. New Georgia really was a group of islands. And B battery got off there. A company, a reinforced company of infantry got off there. And while they're unloading, suddenly a Japanese, two-engine Japanese bomber comes and racing out of the clouds. Cloud cover is very low. We were so startled and it was so close when he came out of the clouds, nobody re was able to react to fire on him. But there were two P-40s on his tail. And he was headed west, probably headed for Munda Air Base, which was at the western end of, of uh, New Georgia. And it disappeared into the clouds. That was the end of that. But while we were unloading, we see a column of troops double timing down the beach. These troops were marine raiders. All the time we were unloading, we thought they were in the jungle, guarding the beach. They weren't. The Navy had put them ashore in the wrong place. 
And uh, as soon as they got down to us, they immediately went into the jungle. Because we knew there, were, there was a Japanese force on the islands. The Japanese, though, had a habit of pulling back from the beaches when they invaded beaches because they were afraid of naval gunfire. <coughs> so the Marines immediately went into the, the jungle chasing them. The Marines got ambushed. The Japanese were really hitting them hard. So immediately the infantry had to go in. Now this was the 103rd Infantry and National Guard outfit. But this outfit had trained in the jungles of, of Panama before they came out in the Pacific. They had a nickname called the Bushmasters. They went in the jungles and between them and the Marines they, they finally wiped out the Japs because they caught the Japs between the two forces. But uh, the next morning we set sail. Beautiful sunshiny day. Our mission was to go to Veru Harbor, which was about half, about the middle of the southern coast of uh, New Georgia Island. Munda was at the far western end, and we there was uh, another armed force, ours, a friendly one, an allied one, on the east end of the island at what was called Sagi Point. Sagi Point, there was an Australian coast watcher there by the name of Kennedy. Kennedy had trained some of the local natives as an armed force, and they armed themselves by ambushing Japanese patrols. We're going to have to stop okay. you right there. Roland, you were telling Roland. about the, the weapons being captured? Oh, oh about us. Uh, about the landings in New Georgia, yeah. We, we proceeded a nice sunshiny day, it was comfortable. It was a perfect day for a sail. The, the water was calm as could be. And we set sail for our objective. And uh, on, on the way, we're, we're sailing along the southern coast of New Georgia, and we see some Navy or Marine Corps planes dive bombing something. We were on the radio silence. By the way, this was June the 30th. D-Day, the real D-Day for New Georgia was July 1st. But uh, we were in an operation called Operation Toenails, believe it or not. And we're sailing towards this point where these planes are doing the dive bombing. Nobody had any idea what was going on. And as we approached the coast, as a matter of fact, whoever was doing the navigating for our LCTs wasn't saying much. He wasn't telling us that we, they, they were dive bombing. That was a, a landing point, you know. But we're sailing along, and we get very close to the coast. The meantime, the dive bombers are gone. We get very close to the coast, and we could pick out a guy on the beach with two dirty rags trying to signal <coughs> our LSTs, LCTs, not LSTs. He's wig-wagging away semaphore signals, and the signalman on our LCT couldn't make out what he was trying to say. What he was trying to say was, stay where you're at, don't come into harbor. We couldn't even see the entrance to the harbor. It wasn't until we got very close, all of a sudden we see it, it was a curving entrance into the harbor. And the cliffs were at least 50 feet high on each side of the harbor. Meantime, we go sailing right on in. As we sail in, somebody fired a rifle shot at us. And look up on the hill, I could see a guy run away. We get out, into the, suddenly the harbor widened out. It looked like a, a big lake when we got into the harbor itself. After we got through the, the passageway into it. And again, we see another guy on the beach. who was a Marine again. He found a dugout or something, paddled out to us, and told us, stay where we were, don't try to come ashore. Meanwhile, we can hear a battle raging in the jungle. You could hear mortars going off, hand grenades, machine guns, rifles. You could hear this going on. We asked the Marine anything he needs. He says, what we need is water. What had happened was, the Marines on their trip from Sagi Point, which was about 10 miles east of us, they had gone overland. And what happened was there was another army force ahead of us that we didn't know about. It. Another reinforced company of, of 
riflemen. They would have stormed the beach while uh, the, the marine raiders, they were marine raiders, would have hit the Japs from the land side. What had happened was in their overland trek, they were ambushed a couple of times, slowed down. They didn't have ser any serious casualties, but it, it did slow them down. They were supposed to be there the day before we arrived. Now the army unit that was supposed to storm the beaches got there and the Japs opened up, opened fire on them with artillery, which according to all our intelligence, there was none there. So they realized then the Marines weren't there. While ship, while uh, soldiers are on naval vessels, they're under the command of the Navy. Whether they go ashore or not is a naval decision, not the Army's decision. So the, the uh, naval officer in charge decided he'd take them to Sagi Point and they would follow the route of the Marines. They were unaware of what happened to the Marines. I often wondered, did they think they were going to rescue the Marines or what was going to happen? But uh, anyway, they started overland. Meantime, the Marines arrived a day late, and they were fighting this battle by themselves when we got there. Late in the afternoon, they told us we could come ashore. So we came ashore, and we had to drag our 40 millimeter guns up this steep passageway, rutted road, you might call it, get them to the top. Meanwhile, a Marine comes up to me. I took one look at him. He had the thousand yard stare. He looked too old to be there. And I couldn't understand why such an old man was there. All he asked for was water. So I handed him my canteen and said, help yourself. He only took two mouthfuls. He says, you're going to need it, and handed it back to me. It turned out this was the chaplain, a father Stedman, who was the idol of these Marines, really, because he always saw to it that there were movies around, they got movies. If there was beer around, he saw to it that they got their share of the beer. He didn't have to go with them, but he felt maybe they'd be more comfortable if he was with them. He was carrying a carbine, but I doubt if he had ever had any intention of ever using it, to tell you the truth. Meantime, we get set up, and some of our men went into the jungles with the Marines to bring out their wounded. The Marines had six or seven men killed, and about ten or twelve men who were wounded. And I remember the Japanese had a small uh, set of graves there, a small plot of graves. And they usually had a white square post on them with Japanese writing on them. And that's where they buried their dead. There were a couple of graves there. Meantime, the Marines brought in their men and they were burying their men. And I remember one Marine very well. He was laying there on a litter, and he asked for a cigarette, somebody gave him a cigarette. He's talking and joking away with these guys, and about two or three minutes later he was dead. It uh, really, I picture that scene over and over again throughout my life, every time I think about Baru Harbor. But uh, they buried their dead with complete ceremonies, salutes, taps, everything went on. And the next morning, CBs came in, and then we found out what our mission really was. Our mission really was to establish a PT boat base at Rue Harbor. And they came in, they started building piers and things, and one thing they didn't know, they cut down palm trees, and they threw them off the cliffs down into the entrance of the harbor, figuring they'd go down later and pick them up. Well, the palm trees sank. They didn't know they were going to sink. They didn't float. But uh, they, while we were there, oh, they, they had a, a 20 millimeter anti-aircraft gun. Now, the Army never used a 20 millimeter anti-aircraft gun, and I found out why. It required the ammunition be greased. And under dusty conditions and everything you have to run into in the Army, you couldn't really use greased ammunition. But the uh, CPs turned this 40 millimeter gun, 20 millimeter gun, over to us, and we uh, manned that as part of our defense equipment. Meantime, the uh, 
A night or two later, it was discovered they spotted lights in the jungle a couple of miles north of us. They figured there was some Japanese there. We, we managed to point our gun directors out and get a, a good location. So we fired our guns in that general direction. It was just about the extreme range of the 40 millimeter guns, but you could see the rounds exploding in that general area. The meantime, the infantry sent a patrol out to see what was there. They went out, didn't find anything. The Marines figured they'd wiped out all the Japanese in the base. About a year ago, I found out they didn't. 187 of the Japanese marched overland to Munda. They got back with their other forces. So they don't always stay and fight to the death. We, uh, one day, we discovered there were strangers among our mists. What it was, it was that company of infantry that went overland. They had infiltrated right into the middle of our group through the Marines, the Marine Raiders. They got into our group and found our whole friendly forces. They identified themselves as, we got to contact our, our company right away. They've got 81 millimeter mortars set up ready to blast the living hell out of this place. The Marines were shocked. 81 millimeter mortars, we had a tough time carrying 60 millimeter mortars. We didn't believe it was possible for anybody to carry 81 millimeter mortars and the ammunition. As these guys told us, every man carried around the 81 millimeter ammunition. A projector from an 81 millimeter is about this big, I don't remember the weight of it, but it was one hell of a gun, believe me. But uh, the Marines were really amazed that anybody could infiltrate past the, their front line. They even had cans hanging on wire with pebbles in them and everything else. But it taught me one thing. The vaunted Marine Raiders were excellent soldiers, no doubt about it. I don't want to put them down or anything else, but they were excellent soldiers. But during the war, I found soldiers that were tougher than them. That was the 82nd Airborne. That's a long ways in the future of my story. I don't know whether we'll even get to it. At any rate, we're there a short time. And we moved. They abandoned the place. They found out they were going to build a PT boat base further west, up near Munda Airport. So we moved back to Van Guna Island, where the other half of our battery was a B battery. And the idea of our setup there was to protect Sagi. Within 24 hours after the landings at Sagi, they had a rough airstrip there, and they were able to, to save several flyers whose planes were damaged. They were able to set down on the CBs that had mowed down all the uh, palms and built uh, an airstrip. And they paved these airstrips with ground-up coral. And it must have been great for these flyers because the coral was white, white as hell. You could see it in the dark. And they paved it, and they kept putting salt water on it, got hard as cement. It was a rel relatively short airstrip because later on I was to fly into it. But we're, the, we're about a month at the Van Guna, and they decided to move us up to where the, uh, the uh, PT boat base is. So we move up, up to there, and we were scattered around several small islands, one gun on an island. I was... My gun crew was on an island with uh, the Navy itself, the PT boatmen. I knew one of the crewmen from Kennedy's crew, as a matter of fact, his, his crew is there. We were the luckiest guys in the battery because we were eating Navy chow. And when then, since we were scattered around, our, our own battery couldn't feed us. Otherwise, the Navy would have had to cart us over water to where our battery headquarters was. So. Uh, we were lucky, we were eating with the Navy, eating Navy chow. When the Navy got a beer ration, we got a beer ration, something we never got in the Army. <laughs> the big difference was when we went to chow, there was a corpsman standing there, and he'd say, open your mouth, and he'd throw the Atterbrand into your mouth. They didn't, like in the Army, they used to hand it to us. But the Navy didn't trust their people or anybody else. The corpsman threw it right in your mouth and made sure you swallowed it. By the way, we were all yellow from the Atterbrand. Your eyeballs were yellow. You, you urinated yellow. Your skin was yellow. Everything was yellow from 
taking it this Adderman. We got to, like I said, we got to know uh, this crewman from uh, Kennedy's crew. Uh, there were constant air raids on Munda Air Base, which was only about three, maybe three miles north of us, and the Japs were raiding there almost every night. And the Japs never came low enough or close enough for us to open fire with our 40 millimeter guns. But we were attached and under the command of, of, a, na of a Marine Defense Battalion. We were part of their, their net and directly under their command. So uh, I remember one night with all the hillbillies in our alpha, we were always brewing something. We got hold of some 10-1 rations which had dried fruit in them. And somehow or other, the guys got told of some yeast. And we were brewing this stuff in, in our jerry cans or water cans used for water, jerry cans for water. And we put it in a hole and covered them over to keep them out of the sun. When you walk near this hole, you can hear this stuff hissing away. So one night we're sitting around, one guy in our group played a harmonica, another guy had a, a guitar. We're sitting around the gun pit, and well, we lived right alongside the gun the whole time we were there. But we stood alerts every evening and every morning, and we're singing away and having a good old time. We decided to break out some of our refreshments, as we called them, and we start drinking the stuff. It was potent. When I saw it in daylight, you wouldn't drink it. And it, had, it was the ugliest looking mess. But in the dark, we were drinking it. And the last thing I remember, I looked around, the gun crew was all scattered around, laying out flat on their backs. But I remembered one important thing. We were scattered there, and I could see air bursts from our anti-aircraft. Holy cripe, there's an air raid. None of us could move. So the next morning, I... <laughs> I, I told I, it was, I told the sergeant, I said, what happened? I said, you know, there was an air raid last night, and that damn phone was ringing away. We had wires strung on the water back to our battery headquarters. He said, that's all right. We'll tell them we were standing by the gun. They didn't come close enough for us to fire, and we found a broken wire on the, on, on the phone line. So the battery headquarters never knew about it. Neither did the Navy men at the other end of the island. This island was less than 100 yards long. I don't know where they were during the air raid. Probably like us, they were pretty much indifferent to things. They were so used to it. But uh, all of a sudden, phone call comes in one day. We've got orders here for you to, to go to OCS. Oh, my God, here we're 22 months overseas, you know, getting the hell out of these tropics. Well, a sergeant was one of these old regular army sergeants, mean SOB, really mean. I remember his name to this day, Sergeant White. He was a Virginian. He, I think he had about 12 years in the army. And he was really mean. He says, when you see Captain Cole, ask him if there's orders from me. So I got the Navy to take me over to the island where the battery headquarters was. And uh, Captain Cole says, you're bunking in my tent tonight. I have to talk to you about what, how you're going to get home and everything else. So uh, we had we had a nice chap. Like I, like I said, uh, I didn't particularly care for him because I thought he was extra hard on the men. But one reason I think I survived the war was from being with that that mess of regular army noncoms and Captain Cole. But anyway. Uh, even Captain Cole even offered me some drinks. The officers had a liquor ration. I guess you're aware of that, which I got in on later on. But uh, we were having drinks there, and very pleasant chat, I must say, about our experiences together and so forth. And the next morning I left the battery. One of the guys asked for my camera, so I gave him my camera. I headed over to Munda. Well, I was stuck on Munda for two days. I was to take a, a plane from the west end of New Georgia Island to Segi Point, where our, our advance headquarters was from my regiment. So uh, I'm stuck there because I had a low priority. My orders called for first available government water transportation. And even that wasn't too readily available. So I reported into the flight crew. And, 
The Army and Navy ran a, a, an operation, there, something like a, a, an airline, believe it or not. The Army had an organization known as MATS, Military Air Transport Service. The Navy had what called NATS, Naval Air Transport Service. So that they worked together like an airline, actually, flying people back and forth through the islands. So finally on the second day, well, the first day I couldn't get out of there. And I, again, one of these things came up. I spotted a Marine truck, and I thought I knew the uh, squadron number painted on the side of this truck. So I went over to talk to these guys. I said, you got a guy by the name of, of Biederman in your outfit? Yeah, yeah. I says, so I went and checked with the guy running the, the flights. He says, oh, you're not going to get out of here today. So I went over to the Marines and said, how about give me a ride to your outfit? So I, I went to the outfit, sure enough, here I meet this kid, Fred Biederman, another guy from my neighborhood, 12,000 miles or so away from home, just as I'm about to leave. I get to talking to him, had, had uh, chow with the Marines. You know, overseas in the combat area, there's no rivalry between services. You're all buddies. Nobody gives a damn whether you're a Marine, Army, or, or Navy. You're all there fighting the same fight. You're all friends. So I spent the afternoon with him, and he told me, he says, when you get home, you get a chance to get to my father on the side. Tell him I'm expecting to be rotated home in about a month. And that was the first time I ever heard of anybody being rotated. Maybe it was just the Marine Flyers, I don't know. He was a gunner on a dive bomber, an SPD dive bomber. And uh, anyway, the next day I get out of there, I get on a plane. You talk about a crowded a New York City subway car, this plane was jammed, standing. The C-47s only had bucket seats along the sides. They were all filled. The rest of the plane was jammed with us standees. I was one of them. And there's an officer sitting there. He looks up to me. He says, McElroy, right? I look down. It's my battalion commander. So he had a major with him. He says to the major, let's wiggle around a bit. Maybe we can get him a seat. So they did, sitting down with him. It was the first chance I ever had to talk one-on-one -on -one with, with my battalion commander. I only knew him from seeing him around, really, and going before the border review. So he says, well, I'll be with you all the way back to Guadalcanal. He said, but we're going to spend a couple of days at Sege Point and straighten out your service records. Well, one thing the Army required, I had to be promoted to corporal before I could be sent home to OCS. So they arranged for the promotion and so forth. And uh, while I was at Sagi, there were air raids against Sagi, and old B Battery was there banging away at the Jap planes. And they had movies every night, the Marine Flyers there. And at the movies, they used to announce the air victories they had that day, how many Jap planes they shot down, and stuff like that. And uh, finally, the, the colonel says to me, Well, we're heading back to the rear area, which was now Guadalcanal. Now on the way, we, we flew into Russell Island, stopped there for lunch. I'm walking down the, along the runway, and I'm surprised to see P-25 bombers with a 75-millimeter cannon sticking out of the front. They had closed in the, the front where the bomber there usually was, and down to the left front, they had stuck these pack gut howitzers into the bomb bay, and it could fire forward. First time I'd ever seen one of those. And it wasn't until after the war, until after I got a couple of years ago, right here, I found a guy who actually flew one of those things. But uh, I got back to Guadalcanal. They arranged for my passage. I was to get on a Navy ship almost immediately. They had to rush me down to get me on a Navy ship, gave me all my orders and everything. Got on a Navy ship. I wasn't on the ship. Five minutes and a pull away, headed back for, I was headed back to New Caledonia again. We set sail that, that afternoon with a, one escort. The Navy combat transports were relatively fast. They told, they, crews told me they could do about 26 knots. Next morning we're all alone at sea, no escort or anything. And after a day or two we come into, into, uh, New Maya Harbor, New Caledonia. It was a funny thing, when I got on the ship, the executive officer, the first thing he asked, 
There were a lot of casuals, so-called casuals on the ship. None of them belonged to any organization. And the executive officer asked for all those casuals on the ship who hadn't turned in their, their records jackets to turn them in. Well, by this time, I was army-wise. I wasn't going to turn anything in. I figured I'll, all I'll do is end up on a work detail. I'm going to enjoy this ride. So I buried my records jackets down the bottom of my duffel bag. <laughs> but that executive officer knew there were guys on that ship didn't turn in their records. Because you get to New Caledonia and he announces, all those who haven't turned in their records will do so now before they leave the ship. So I figured, well, it's safe to hand them in now. So he put us in a replacement depot, or a rebel depot as we called them. And by the way, I found out even in Vietnam they still call them rebel depots. Were you there? Mm -hmm. That was. I, I, I see him shaking his head, he's always aware of this. And uh, we get in this rebel depot. Now there were about six or eight of us who were going back home to go to OCS, various schools. And at the Rebel Depot, they put you on a work detail every morning, unloading ships. They put us on the trucks. But before the truck got to the front gate, everybody who had been up in the islands was off the truck. The guys on the trucks were guys fresh out of the States. But we jumped the trucks all the time. And then on comes that this Rebel Depot would come and find us there. And they'd raise hell with us, and we could tell them what they could do with themselves, you know. And this went on every blinking morning. Finally, after a while, they didn't bother coming near us because we call them rear echelon goof-offs and things like that. So finally, uh, one day they said, okay, you're leaving. Got on a ship this time. We sailed down from uh, Guadalcanal on the uh, USS Pinckney. We left New Georgia on the General George Squires, another Navy ship. It was a ship that was built in the Kaiser shipyards. It had a silhouette looking more like a, an oil tanker than a, a cargo ship because it had a deck house. The bridge was way forward. It had a big deck house and a stack at the rear. Meantime, there were low cabins in the middle of the ship. We get on this, this ship and we pulled out again. We only had an escort for the first day. After the first day, we were all alone crossing the Pacific Ocean. And because the few officers from the Navy and uh, the Army and Marines were on the ship were all wounded men. They were in plaster casts and running, walking around the decks with, with uh, crutches and things. They decided they would split the casuals up into various companies and put us guys who were going back to OCS in command of them. We slept in officers' country on the ship as a result of that. The ship had over 600 men, all battle fatigue cases. And never having run into battle fatigue cases, I was surprised because they looked as healthy as hell to me. It didn't look like there was anything wrong with them. Partway across the ocean, we run across a ship. It must have been from a neutral country because it was still painted black and white. Every other ship I'd seen all during the war was always painted gray. When, when they came upon this ship, they called GQ and manned the guns of the ship, and they, they circled this ship three or four times before they were satisfied. I guess it was neutral, and finally took off. And the Marine guard that we used to talk to every day in the officer's country, he was telling us, this, this skipper is a retired Navy man who wanted to get on a line vessel, but they put him in charge of a troop transport. He says, he's anxious to get some action. <laughs> But just outside of San Francisco, we hit an awful storm, a horrible storm. And the ship was running light. It was its maiden voyage, by the way. It sounded like the ship was coming apart. It really did. To sleep that night, you didn't sleep. I was in a bunk, and I was hanging on for dear life to keep from getting thrown out on the deck. It seemed like the ship was going to roll right over. We, the, we were just off the coast. And there was a Navy blimp came out to escort us in. And that blimp sometimes would be 500 feet in the air, the next minute it would be almost touching the tops of the waves. I never saw such huge waves in my life as, as that day. And towards evening, everything calmed down. It was approaching sunset. We were approaching the uh, submarine nets outside of San Francisco Harbor. And I understood if we didn't get in there before sunset, we'd have had to sail around all night before they'd 
they'd open up the nets during the day. But as you're sailing there with some girls up on the, the bridge, the Oakland Bay Golden Gate Bridge, you know, hollering down, we were hollering back, whistling and everything. I don't know, this executive was, he had no sense of humor at all. He threatened that if we didn't quiet down, we'd all have to go below decks. You know, what a grouch. We pulled into a pier, and, and a bunch of young guys in civilian clothes climb on the ship. And we're looking at them and thinking, well, who the hell are these guys? You know, they, they look like they should have been in uniform. We didn't find out until later. You know, FBI men and uh, the Army uh, Intelligence Group, I forget the name of the intelligence group, they came on board. What they were after, they wanted every man that had anything to do with radar, went through his luggage to find out if he had any written material on it. And that's all they were really after. We pulled out in the harbor to Angel Island, which uh, was, it was Fort McDowell was on Angel Island. And uh, we got to talking to some of the guys stationed at Fort McDowell. They wouldn't talk to us. They must have had it pounded into their heads. They were not to discuss anything on the island because they wouldn't. They had a huge mess hall there. It was, it was sort of a port of embarkation place. Had a huge mess hall. They were feeding about 3,000 men there. Well, people leaving the country and people coming in. And uh, I remember they put us on KP. And they didn't give a damn what your rank was. Even master sergeants in the casuals had to so work on KP. And we f were fed good. But I remember one strange thing. It would be dark in the morning. We'd be standing in line at this mess hall. We could look down in the bay. And I can understand why nobody ever escaped from Alcatraz, which was just a short ways away from us. I watched two logs, railroad ties, go flying past that island like they had upward motors on. It was unbelievable. They must have had some tides running in on that bay. But uh, we were there about three or four days. They went through our luggage when we weren't present. I don't know what they were looking for, but they did go through our luggage. We, we came back after one of the orientation things we found, or from medical exams, and we'd find all our stuff all over the bed, you know. What they were after, I have no idea, because I was carrying trench knives and everything else home with me. But uh, they, they didn't say anything about it. When we, uh, a couple of days later, we were allowed to go into town. San Francisco was a great town, a great leave town. But there was one restriction on Army personnel there. It was not, didn't affect the Marines or the Navy. The local area command there had issued an order that no soldier was to be allowed to drink liquor in a bar before 5 p.m. The Navy and the Marines could do it. They threatened to close down the bar. I guess they had a sort of martial law in San Francisco then, of some date sort. But at any rate, I had to wait till 5 o'clock before I could get a beer. One of the nice things about the town, I went to a USO club, and I remember this woman at the USO club. You could get food there. And I remember I had my corporal stripes, but I, didn't, I had a brand new uniform, which they issued me. And I remember this woman, she was sewing patches and things on. I asked if she sew on my overseas stripes and my... Uh, my corporal stripes. So I started to tell her where to put them. She's, you don't have to tell me. She says, I know the regulations. And she sewed on these stripes for me. But uh, it was a great leave town. And a few days later, I get tickets and everything, get put on a train to head home. And it was the, the Denver and Western Railroad. And we leave from Oakland area. By the way, the only boat allowed to go anywhere near uh, Alcatraz is the army boat that runs back and forth. There were uh, Coast Guard cutters, look like Coast Guard cutters, constantly circling on the island. All visitors and all prisoners were brought back and forth on the army's boat. But we, get out, we got on the train, it was late in the evening, I found my, my Pullman car, got on it. And it's, it's the Christmas season, by the way few days before Christmas, I had to look up a date. 
and get on the train. The train leaves at night. And I remember the first real stop the train made was high up in the mountains, and I got out and was bitter cold. Here I'd been in the tropics all this time. But uh, I took a walk around. We were somewhere near Salt Lake City. The train took off. We pulled into Denver. While we were in Denver, the train was there a few hours. They dropped off some cars. And what happened, after the train pulled out, some of the soldiers who were traveling in a coach found they couldn't find their baggage, so they went to see the conductor. And the conductor asked them about it, and it turns out the car that their baggage was in was one of them dropped off. They backed that train all the way back to Denver so these guys could get their luggage. They got their luggage. We were five hours late pulling out of Denver. Well, I'm telling you, when that, tra that train, it made up most of the time before we got to Chicago. But when uh, you go to the dining car and you look out the window, the, the poles almost look like fence posts. That train was tra seemed to be traveling so fast. But everybody was, was in a holiday mood. The, you, those with radios, you could hear Christmas music. And I had an upper bunk. The only thing I didn't like was the Army had special meal tickets for us and for the, the dining car. So we were only allowed certain things to eat, like oatmeal for breakfast, something I was never very happy about. We get to Chicago, and I had to go to Crosstown to get to the Pennsylvania Railroad. Had to rush Crosstown, really had to go fast. Just about got there in time to get on, on the Pennsylvania Railroad train. Fortunately, my baggage was checked all the way through to New York. So I remember that night eating in the dining car. I was tired, and the porter fixed up the bunk early. I went to bed all night long. All I could hear when I was awake was the constant sounds of steam trains passing, slow freights. They sound like they were probably hauling war material and stuff. And I guess at the one point it was probably when we hit the old horseshoe loop there in the Pennsylvania, because all I could hear was. The steam exhaust. I got into New York City the following day about, oh, must have been about 1 o'clock in the afternoon, looked to find the Long Island Railroad train, got on the Long Island Railroad train. It was a cloudy, overcast day. I'm walking, I was used to walking from the railroad station where we lived. I got out and wanted to walk anyway to see the town. It was, I didn't see anybody along the way overcast. I stopped at a bar along the way, got myself a drink. They refused any payment from me because I, I, they, they found out, talking to them, they found out I had been overseas. They wouldn't take any, everybody in the bar wanted to dry, buy me a drink. I would have had it been carried home. I still had about another half mile to walk home. I had to thank them and say, and head home. On the way home I meet a little girl. This little girl was later to become my sister-in-law. Yeah. As a matter of fact, my wife is with her today. And I walk up to her and say, Mary! And she looks at me. She just stares there, staring at me. Everything had changed. The kids had all changed, Sergeant. She didn't say a blinking word. I said, aren't you Mary Leah? Not a sound out of her. She just stands there. All of a sudden, she turns and runs. Well, maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> I walked down a half block to my house to get there. Nobody's home. In those days, everybody left the house unlocked. Nobody locked the houses. The only one there to greet me was the dog. I get in, walk through the house, looking things over. I hear a noise outside. There's three or four women racing up the street. Somebody had seen me. My mother had been with some neighbors a block or two away. And the neighbors used to get together, and they used to share one another's letters from their sons in the service, and read them, and swap news. And here they are coming up the street, running up the street, and they come in the house. There was the quiet moment in that house for the rest of that evening till that night. I had been writing to my wife, with no idea of ever marrying her at the time. It was just. Somebody from the neighborhood was, she used to send me magazines and things. I, I used to play ball with her brother and everything. I knew her before the war. I knew her in school, too. But at any rate, she comes in the house, runs over, grabs me, and gives me a big kiss. 
later her father comes home from work. They live just down the street from our house. I can see the back door of their house from our house front, front door. Her father comes in. He had a son in Italy at the time. He was Italian. As a matter of fact, he was born in Italy. He comes in the house, walks over to me, throws his arms around, gives me a tight hug, let's go, walks through the house out the back door. Never said a word. Very emotional man. But he never said a word when he back home. Hey, um, I'm going to interrupt a second. Um, we do have another interview. Going yeah, in. I figure we'll never get Could, through this. Well, uh, I, we'll go to 11. Could uh, I just ask you some questions? Sure, go could, ahead. Um, how long were you home before you went to OCS? I had a 10-day delay en route. Uh -huh. I walked into the house on the 23rd of December. What was, year was that? This was 1943. 43, okay. That was the first time i have been home since 1941. Uh -huh. And I w it was the first Christmas home. I never got home for any of the uh, Thanksgivings while I was in the service. Uh -huh. At no time did I get home for that. But this was the first Christmas. Uh -huh. It was... My mother knew about me meeting this guy, Crotty, who was uh, a machine surprise man, the first guy I met in the Navy in the Pacific. She found out he was home. She called up and he and his mother showed up at the house. She never let on about it. And he showed up there. Like I say, for th that night, the house was crowded with people coming and going. There was nothing for me to do during the day. Everybody was gone. You didn't see anybody my age on the street until one day I ran into one guy I gone to school with. He was a divinity student. The strange thing about this guy, he wanted to go to college and study chemistry. He was interested in chemistry. But his grandfather would only pay for his college education if he went to divinity school. And this guy looked utterly miserable. He really did. And here I am in uniform and everything, talking to him. But he seemed to be the unhappiest guy I ever met. But he's the only one I ever met. Oh, my, bro my mother, I don't know how she knew this. When I started home, it took me two months to get home. Once I started home, I stopped writing letters. I disliked writing letters because you were so limited to what the heck you could write. And she started getting worried. She worked in a defense plant, and there was a major there, I think, that tipped the roof. She found out I was on my way home. Mm -hmm. I have a hunch this major must have had, had some uh, way of finding out. And uh, not only that, my brother, who was in the Navy, had been home on leave. He was on the Philadelphia. His ship was the flagship for, for the landings at Casablanca during the... African invasion. But his ship, its home port was Brooklyn, and he was always coming home. People used to say to him, my God, you're still around here? They didn't know he'd been away and back again. But he had just been home on leave, and he was now stationed in Florida on, on uh, patrol craft, PC boats, down near Miami. And my mother knew who to contact. She sent a, a telegram off this to the naval commander in, of the district in Florida. And my brother got home. How in the hell, he got home before Christmas. How he got home so fast, I don't remember. It's one of the funny things. I remember asking him how he did it, but I don't remember what his reply was. But he got home real fast. And so he was home for a while. And my other buddy, who was in the Americal Division, he was home. He had been uh, uh, severely infected with... Uh, Malaria. So bad that, that later on, he, when he got out of the army, he had a 100% disability. Right. Gonna, when did you, go to, where right. did you go to OCS? I went to OCS at Camp Davis, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And it's funny, on the way to Camp Davis, lo and behold, I meet a Marine buddy of mine who <laughs> came from the hometown, who was on the train I was traveling on. He was at Camp Lejeune. Uh, Camp Davis was right near Camp Lejeune. So I, I get there and uh, naturally I'm exposed to the chicken and everything. Things are very informal overseas. All this time I had no idea how and why I was picked to go to OCS. And uh, about two weeks before graduation, 
the bird dog, the officer in charge of our class, he said to me, there's an officer standing over at the end of the field over there, you ought to report to him. I'm thinking, oh, what the hell's going on here? It was the hour of charm where we were out doing close order drill and stuff. So I go over there, and lo and behold, it's one of the officers from my battery in the South Pacific. Lieutenant Roger Husky. I've never written his name down because I didn't dare try to spell it. But uh, first thing he says to me, you know how you got here? I said, not really. He says, well, it was Captain Cole who decided to put you up for OCS. And he says, you know why? He said, they were looking for candidates for OCS, and they went through the entire regiment to pull out everybody who had a, an IQ of 110 or more. He says, you had the highest IQ in the regiment. Your, reg your IQ is 144. So, he said, they went to Captain McCollum at the time and asked him what he recommended. He, Captain McCollum said, no. Cole stepped forward right away and said, I'll recommend him. So, without me knowing it, whoever asked me would I apply for OCS never let on to me that Cole was behind us. And Cole at the time was only a first lieutenant. But being who he was and what he was and all his years of service, I guess his Anything he said carried a lot of weight. So that's how I ended up in OCS. When did you graduate from OCS? I, I, May 25th, 1944, I graduated from OCS. And the whole class was transferred to the infantry right off the bat because uh -huh. they no longer needed any aircraft artillery officers. So we were shipped off to Fort Benning for a special infantry officers training school. When I get down there, there were thousands of officers from all branches of the army being recycled as infantry officers. To me, that was a kiss of death to be sent to the infantry because I knew what their casualty rates were like. Mm -hmm. The infantry at the most never exceeded more than about 14% of the army and took about 70 to 80% mm -hmm. of all the casualties. I was fully aware of that, you know. Anyway, I ended up going, getting sent after I finished that course, they sent me to the 75th Division, and there they assigned me to the 290th Regiment. And I, in OCS, I specialized in guns because I was familiar with automatic weapons. So I was trained in 90 millimeter guns. As a result of this, I think, they put me in anti tank company because in the gun batteries, you used to practice anti tank ca tactics. So, uh, Fortunately, here I end up in another defensive unit. I wasn't in a rifle company, thank God. The only problem with air tank company, you met German tanks. God helped the, the gun crew to open fire on them, because they didn't have a chance, really. But at any rate, I went overseas with an outfit. Mm -hmm. you know? When did you go overseas? We went overseas in October. Now, I joined that outfit in late September, so I was only with them about, mm -hmm. about uh, several weeks before we went overseas. We spent about a month in Wales, and then we were shipped to, to France. We landed in France on uh, the 13th of, uh, I should know, December. We were there, we were gathering the regiment and the division together. Well, we were a motorized company, so we traveled in the motor convoy. The, the riflemen and all, they traveled in 40 and 8 boxcars. Uh -huh. So I remember passing through the battlefield at Mons and I couldn't believe what I saw. Mile after mile after mile were nothing but German armored vehicles and trucks all burned along the side of the road. I couldn't believe the destruction I saw. Uh -huh. we, get, we were to be part of the 9th Army. We get to the 9th Army and in between this, it was the 19th of December when we left France. We report to the to the 9th Army, and we, the convoy pulls up, and the officer in charge comes out. We're going to the 1st Army. Right away, we were transferred right off the bat to the uh -huh. 1st Army, which was being hit hard. It was then we heard about the Battle of the Bulge. Uh -huh. Montgomery had started to take over command of the troops on the north side. And I do remember the, the, I was stopped. I, somehow or other, on the way towards towards the Meuse River. We would cross the Meuse River at We. It was a rainy night. We were drowned, soaking wet. We were not allowed to put on any 
tops up on our trucks and vehicles. We were drowning in the rain, and it was bitter cold, soaked to the skin. And somehow or other, we got lost from the column. And I'm looking for my, I have one, one of my gun squads in there. I couldn't find the other two gun squads. So we crossed the river. Mm -hmm. And I'm traveling up and down this road looking for to the other gun squads. I told the other gun squad, stay parked, because they couldn't afford to burn gas. My Jeep was, uh, didn't burn gas like them. And I hunted and hunted and couldn't find out. I checked in the MPs, and they wouldn't talk or not. They wouldn't own up to anything or knowing where the outfit was or anything else. Riding back and forth, we were stopped one time by some paratroopers. This paratroopers got an M1 rifle leveled straight at me. He says, you got any officer's ID? I said, yes, I do. I said, it's inside my coat. I have to reach inside my coat. He said, well, just move real slow. Meantime, I had a wise guy radio man in the Jeep with me. He turns to the paratroopers and says, there's three of us. We could take you on easily, you know. I said, for Christ's sake, Grim, shut your big mouth, you know. And with that, the paratrooper says, you better take a look behind you. There's three more guys standing there with rifles trained on us. I said, what's this all about? I handed him the ID card, which I still have, by the way. And the, he said, there are Germans in American uniforms in the area. And he says, we're trying to find them. I found out later, the Germans were actually watching that bridge we crossed, some of them. Anyway, we finally find our column. I found the... Uh, artillery outfit that was always attached to our regiment. So I said to the captain, can I get in the column? He said, sure, get in the column. The Belgian people were nervous as hell. And the column would stop and go, stop and go. And every time we'd stop, they'd all run out to the vehicles with this homemade farm bread with meat on it, hot cups of coffee. Mm -hmm. and, and the Belgians were, were great, you know. And I guess they were happy to see troops going forward rather than troops going backwards, you know. So they were running out there feeding us. And I come up the road and I find my captain there. He was wondering what the hell happened to us. But that night they discovered two German, two or three Germans in American uniforms right where we were. Huh. And the MPs took them in the woods and shot them. My, my sergeant was present when they caught them. So the paratroopers weren't far off their mark. But uh, Did you ever engage any of the German tanks with your... Uh no, we never did. We used our guns for various other things, but never against German tanks. Uh, now, what kind of type of uh, anti-tank guns were you oh, using? We had 57 millimeters. Mm -hmm. when they were British guns. The British call them six-pounders. When they first used them in the desert, they were, they were able to, to compete with the German tanks at that mm -hmm. time, the Mark IVs and things. Mm -hmm. But when they came out with the Panther and the Tiger, you had to get a rear or a close-in side shot to knock knock out a panther. I don't know if you could knock out a uh -huh. tiger. Because I've seen tigers with, with 90 millimeter rounds stuck right in the armor. They never pierced it. Just welded right into them, uh -huh. you know. But, uh, no, we were lucky in that regard. I, I, uh, the first night I remember going up to, I was assigned a position on a, the far left flank of the uh, regiment. The second battalion, actually, I was attached to our second battalion. But coming up from where our battery command post was, who was standing in the middle of the road with the, the regimental command? I hated this man's guts. He was German born, by the way. Colonel Duffner. In the regular army, he was known as the Iron Duke. He was the first sergeant in World War I in the U.S. Army and went to West Point from there. But he stops me. He says, You know what your orders are? I said, Yes, sir, I know what your orders are. Do you know what your orders are? He must ask me this three times, but he never asked me what the orders were. Just did I, did I know what they were? Finally, he says, okay, go ahead. And he was in a panic in my mind. That's the way I saw him. I wasn't in a panic. But when I got to the position I was told to go to, I find one Sherman tank there and a platoon of towed uh, tank destroyer guns. Were they happy to see us? These guys had come out of St. Vith. You know, uh -huh. they had been retreating all this time. And I said, I said, you got plenty of equipment here. Yeah, but there's never enough. 
Mm -hmm. the baby play. Mm -hmm. They were so happy to see us. Oh, jeez. We spent one day there, and the next day we moved forward again, mm -hmm. closer to our 2nd Battalion that we were with. So I was fortunate to be attached to the 2nd Battalion because they had a Colonel Harris there who was not afraid of anybody, a reserve officer. And after we had spent a couple of weeks in combat there, we were called together. Normally I wasn't in on this, but this time I was there with the officers to hear this new attack order. And what came out of it, after it's all through, the colonel says, any question? Colonel Harris steps forward, and believe it or not, his exact words were, I refuse to attack. Everybody in the room, he refused to attack. And the colonel, Duffney says, Colonel, what'd you say? He says, I refuse to attack. And the two other battalion commanders were West Pointers. Harris was a reserve officer. Duffner was a West Pointer. And with that, Duffner says, all the officers are excused except the battalion commanders. When Harris told him the condition of his battalion, and the other battalions were in the same condition, but they never said a word. We were pulled out of the line that night and sent back. We were, we were attached to another division, by the way, at the time. We weren't even with our own division. That night we were returned to our own division. We were in horrible shape, we really were. We had been in the line constantly from the 23rd December to the 11th of January without any rest. And Harris's battalion was in really bad shape, but he was a gutsy officer. The only battalion commander I knew who would walk the front line, walk the foxholes of his men saw him. The others didn't, but he did. The third battalion commander at West Point was relieved of his command a couple of days after that. Harris stayed in command. Harris had no use for the regimental commander, and the regimental commander knew it. Because I happened to be present one time when Harris said something about the regimental commander. And I said, I agree with you, Colonel. He turns to me in a real gruff voice. He says, you didn't hear a goddamn thing I said. Remember that. Is this the way he spoke, you know? I said, no, Colonel, I didn't hear a word. But so how much longer were you in combat? Uh, we were in combat all the way up to, well, we would pull out of line there, but we went back into the line again. And uh -huh. From the Bulge, we went down to Colmar. From Colmar, we went to Holland. From Holland, we went into Germany and to the Rhine River. We screened the, uh, the front lines on the Rhine River for the attack across the Rhine. Uh -huh. I crossed the Rhine on my birthday. Two days earlier, we were scheduled to go across. That's how well it went. Uh -huh. But, uh, yeah. I remember that night, it was a lonely, dark night. My platoon was all by itself after they got across the Rhine. It was, uh, but, uh, you know, in some ways I enjoyed the Army, in other ways, when the war ended, I wasn't too anxious to go home, I'll tell you that. I was glad the war was over. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that always struck me since the war were the scenes of people celebrating in all the cities around the world. Frontline soldiers didn't celebrate. They were quiet as hell. In our outfit, no cheer, no nothing. Uh -huh. We were told we were finished. Everybody accepted it. Thank God we made it. Uh -huh. And that's the way it was. Uh -huh. Nobody celebrated at all. There was no celebration in the front line. Very quiet, and I read since then, this was true of other outfits. Uh -huh. The troops at the front didn't stand up and cheer or dance around or anything else. Just quietly accepted the fact that they made it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go home. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your interview. Okay. Um.